welcome all of you to this final lecture in our series on literary theory. Today, uh, though we would be briefly touching upon ecocriticism and rasa theory, my uh, main focus would be on opening up certain fundamental questions which should help you to think about literary theory and think about it by going beyond what we have already discussed during the course of this lecture series. Now, if you look at the various kinds of literary theory that uh, have been gaining ground from around the second half of the 20th century, uh, you will see that almost all of them speak in terms of decentering something or the other. Uh, so, for instance, with feminism, you have the decentering of uh, male centric discourses. Uh, with uh, post structuralism, you have the decentering of the author and indeed of all notions of transcendental signified that can fix meaning from outside the language system. With post colonialism, you have the decentering of the West and of uh, the Eurocentric discourse of colonialism. And all of these various decentering projects have come together, have added up to form what Lyotard defines as a postmodern condition that is characterized by an incredulity towards meta narratives in general. Now, when we turn towards uh, such contemporary trends in the field of literary theory like ecocriticism, we find this decentering gesture taking a radical new form. Because in ecocriticism, what is being decentered is the idea of human itself and all the anthropocentric, that is, human centric grand narratives pivoted on man. Though ecocriticism majorly draws its inspiration from the works of three 19th century writers, uh, namely Ralph Waldo Emerson, Margaret Fuller and Henry David Thoreau, it only came to prominence in the anglophone sphere of literary studies, especially in America from around the last decades of the 20th century. And uh, its main thrust has been to undermine the idea of human being as a dominating force vis-a-vis -vis nature. Instead of regarding man as the master of his physical surrounding, the eco-critics try to situate human beings as merely one of the many elements within a complex ecosystem. In the post-Renaissance West, a man or more specifically the white adult human male was upheld as the measure of all things. Nature with all its living and non-living components was imagined in the form of a pyramid where man is posited at the very top as a triumphant master. This notion of man as the master was even further bolstered by the tremendous technological advancements made in the West during the centuries following the Enlightenment. But uh, as we saw in our uh, lecture on modernism and postmodernism, the devastation created by the two world wars shook this confidence in the grand narrative which posited man as a supreme master who exercised control over all inanimate and animate beings. And of course, this included women and the quote unquote immature and barbaric inhabitants of uh, the colonies who were regarded to be at best uh, aspirants to the status of fully developed human beings. Uh, this confidence in man being a sane, mature 
and even protective master of the world was jolted, as I said, by the two world wars, but it was also jolted by the real fear of our ecosystem running out of various necessary resources like clean water for instance or clean air after centuries of systematic exploitation and this fear of we running out of necessary resources have been growing ever since the second world war at least. So within this scenario of fear and despondence Eco-criticism mainly tries to address these four issues. The first issue that the eco-critics try to address is that of how man's conceptualization of himself as a dominating force in nature disrupts and destroys and sometimes irretrievably so vital aspects of the ecosystem. The second issue that concerns the eco-critics is that of imagining man as a part of rather than as the master of the ecosystem. So the first and the second issues act as counterparts to each other. The third issue with which eco-criticism uh, deals with, which eco-critics highlight is the issue of canon formation and uh, especially the issue of creating a canon out of the contemporary eco-literature. And what do I mean by eco-literature? Well, eco-literature is a body of contemporary literature which draws attention to environmental crisis and which helps us imagine possible futures for our ecosystem. The fourth issue also deals with uh, canon formation but from a different perspective. So eco-criticism concerns itself not merely with contemporary eco-literature but it also tries to reread the established literary canons from the perspective of ecological concerns. Therefore, within the field of eco-criticism you will find readings of uh, works of William Wordsworth for instance, Thomas Hardy for instance and they are read through the lens of the twin concerns that I have spoken about in points 1 and 2. So uh, now that we have a rough idea of um, what constitutes eco-criticism, this is the question that I want to open up for you. In this series of literary theory, we have seen how the activity of literature has always been understood in human centric terms. Uh, Let us uh, try and understand this through examples. Uh, say for instance, one way of looking at literature as we have discussed has been author uh, centric, has been theories which revolve around the figure of the author. And the author is made the pivot on which literary creation rests. Uh, this is a view of uh, literature where the human centricity is most clearly evident because in uh, such kinds of theories revolving around the author, literature is understood as the creation of an extraordinary human mind. But this same degree of human centricity is also evident for instance in ways of looking at literature which foregrounds the reader and which foregrounds the methods in which literature involves the reader's human cognitive abilities and his or her human emotions. Even literary theories which foreground language are also actually centered around human beings because language is ultimately a part of human social relation, human communication and that human aspect of language is very much present in all the language centered uh, literary theories that we have 
discussed so far. Now, if we consider a theory like ecocriticism, where man is not at the center, can we then have a substantial discussion on literature at all within its framework? In other words, does ecocriticism breach a very fundamental boundary, the fundamental boundary of human centrism? Uh, within which literature has been created, consumed and discussed for centuries now. If we decenter man, does literature itself become decentered? These are uh, the questions that I would like to leave open for you, for you to ponder. But I would also like to add a few more questions. Uh, to this set. And I would like to do so by first talking very briefly about the Rasa theory. Now, as I had uh, mentioned early on in this lecture series, one of my intentions has been to connect the field of literary theory more closely with our position as students of English literature located in India. Recent developments like the rise of post-colonial studies within the field of literary theory has made this project even more viable because uh, it has succeeded, albeit unevenly, to decenter the West from its pivotal position within the departments of Anglophone literary studies all around the world actually. And uh, one of the signs of uh, this decentering is that names of authors like uh, Chinu Achebe, the Nigerian author or the Caribbean author Derek Walcott or the Indian author Salman Rushdie, they now appear in the syllabus of various English departments across the world with quite interesting regularity. This was of course unthinkable even say 60 or 70 years ago, when the syllabus would almost exclusively consist of white male literature produced in the West. But uh, though the literature that is studied within the English departments have been um, becoming more and more cosmopolitan, more and more eclectic, and largely thanks to the inclusion of works produced in the Global South, what we understand as literary theory from within the framework of our English departments, that has still remained largely Western. And by that I mean the literary theory uh, that gets studied by us as students of English literature still gets generated within Western academia. And uh, interestingly enough, this also includes uh, post-colonial theory because as you will remember from our earlier discussions, be it Edward Said or be it Homi Bhaba or be it Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak, all of them are or were in case of Edward Said primarily associated with elite western universities like Columbia or Harvard. Uh, moreover, the philosophical template on which these theorists have built their theories have also been primarily European templates. So, for instance, we find um, Edward Said building on Foucault's philosophy of discourse, Bhaba engaging with Freud and his notions of the unconscious. Uh, Spivak finds her interlocutors in people like Immanuel Kant, for instance, Friedrich Schiele, Karl Marx, Jacques Derrida, so on and so forth. And uh, in fact, uh, she also declares, she admits that she is a Europeanist. Now here, since I am making some generalized comments about the West and since I am talking about a European philosophical uh, template or a Western philosophical template, let me uh, try to at least partially absolve myself from the charges of essentialism by quoting a passage from Deepesh Chakravarti's uh, seminal text, Provincializing Europe, and I want to present this passage in my defense. Chakravarti writes, and I quote, The so-called 
European intellectual tradition is the only one alive in the social science departments of most if not all modern universities. I use the word alive in a particular sense. It is only within some very particular traditions of thinking that we treat fundamental thinkers who are long dead and gone, not only as people belonging to their own times, but also as though they were our own contemporaries. In the social sciences, these are invariably thinkers one encounters within the tradition that has come to call itself quote unquote European or quote unquote Western. I am aware that an entity called quote the European intellectual tradition stretching back to the ancient Greeks is a fabrication of relatively recent European history. The point, however, is that fabrication or not, this is the genealogy of thought in which social scientists find themselves inserted. Few, if any Indian social scientists or social scientists of India would argue seriously with, say, the 13th century logician Gangesha or with the grammarian and linguistic philosopher Bhartrihari, 5th to 6th centuries, or with the 10th or 11th century aesthetician Abhinavagupta. What Chakravarti says about the broader field of social sciences also holds true about the narrower field of literary studies and literary theory in particular. So, for instance, even uh, when we see Bhava or Spivak engaging with India and with the literature coming out of this uh, subcontinent as their subjects of inquiry, we do not find them engaging with, uh, let us say, such ancient Indian aestheticians and literary theorists like Bharatamuni, who wrote the Natya Shastra, or uh, Anandavardhan, who established the Dhvani theory and uh, who is known as the author of Dhvanyalok. So, here is a project that I want to talk about. What if we try to decenter the primacy of the West or Europe by re-engaging with such ancient Indian institutions from within the framework of English literary studies? It might be interesting, for instance, to see how uh, something like the Rasa theory that is based on the idea of emotional essences and that is uh, mentioned among various texts that is mentioned in Natya Shastra, how that can be made alive. And I am using alive here in the sense that Deepesh Chakraborty uses the term alive within the context of the departments of English literary studies. I would definitely encourage you to pursue this line of thought, but um, I think there is also a catch here and uh, let me bring that up for you. As I have been saying from the introductory lecture itself, theory within the field of literary studies cannot exist independently of literature. It does not make any sense. We have thus seen how the emergence of uh, theories like feminism, for instance, post-colonialism or even eco-criticism is also marked by the foregrounding of new literary canons and or at the very least a conscious re-evaluation of uh, pre-existing literary canons. Uh, if we decide to engage with the Rasa theory, or even with the Dhvani theory, for instance, what kind of literature should we apply them to? In their original context, these theories were complemented by certain traditions of Sanskrit uh, dramatic and poetic literature. Uh, but these literary traditions are unavailable to a modern student situated within the department of English literature. 
So, should we then try and modify these ancient aesthetic theories into tools of literary criticism that will help us read the kind of literature that is usually read as part of our English literature syllabus. But then will such an attempt at radical modification completely dismantle the very basic tenets of these ancient aesthetic theories? On the other hand, we can try to enlarge the kind of literature that is studied within uh, the English departments and we can try and include uh, Sanskrit dramas and poetry that originally complemented the Rasa theory and the Dhvani theory. Will such an expansion of the field of our studies result in a dilution of our fundamental understanding of uh, English literature and uh, will it not take us altogether beyond the uh, boundary of the category of English literature? Well, I do not have answers to these questions, though I think that they are important questions, which is why I would invite you to think about them and uh, to see uh, where these questions lead you to. And with this, I will end this series of lecture. I am acutely aware of the many topics that I have not been able to touch at all or touch only very briefly. However, that was somewhat a conscious decision because uh, what I wanted to do most was that I wanted you to grasp some of the major concepts uh, in this field in sufficient details rather than to just give you a, a comprehensive and superficial summary. I uh, therefore hope that you will uh, use this lecture series as a first step that will lead you to inquire further into this field of literary theory. And I wish you all the best for your future research. Goodbye.